This is a lamb's pluck. We're going to use it as a demonstration for a class to teach the structure and function of the breathing system in mammals. The first thing I like to do with any form of dissection is relate it to the human anatomy. Students are more interested in their own bodies than they are of the internal workings of a lamb. So I'd hold it up to my body and say, well, OK, here is the trachea. This is pretty much exactly like the trachea in my neck going down into my chest. The lungs, slightly small, maybe. But if I was to open up a person, they would look pretty much exactly the same. And there, in the middle of the chest, is the heart. Having the structure there in front of you, you can have a learning conversation with the students. They can inquire and you can follow their route of inquiry rather than students being led through with a video or a worksheet or an animation. The very first thing to look at, I think, is the trachea, a tube that is held open by these rings of cartilage and you can see them as the white structures in this cut-off section here. It's a good example of how structure is related to function in this breathing system. The trachea is a tube that transports air and it needs to be permanently open. And so these C-shaped rings of cartilage hold that open. So that's the cartilage and the pink is connective tissue. Um, in contrast, there's an, there's an artery here and this artery I can squash and close, and it's got a very muscular wall. It's not held open. And that's because in real life, this will have uh, blood, a liquid flowing through it, whereas the trachea has evolved to be held open, so there is always this airway down into the lungs. This is a real three-dimensional object, a tube. And in a, in a diagram, it's just going to be a, a circular representation, but here we can see that it's actually a tube, and I can stick my finger through it and show that it's hollow. This is something that I would pass around students to get them to have a, have a little feel. Obviously, they don't have to have a f feel of it if they don't want to, so that's quite important. I don't want them hating biology because they're forced into doing something they don't want to do, but a lot of them are actually really interested and, and actually in my experience, I get quite a few who don't want to touch but want to look, and so they're sat next to someone who will, who will show it to them, That's another student who will show it to them. It's important to be aware of the possibility of students fainting. It, it does happen. I say to students that it is a physiological response of the body. It is not something about your personal feelings. It is a physiological response of the body that you have no control over. Um, in order to manage that, and I would make sure that the students around me were always in my eye line and that they were sat down and I would tell them beforehand the signs of first starting to feel faint. So if they, if they feel a bit queasy, start sweating a lot, they, I want them to be analysing themselves um, and I want other students to be aware of their friends around them and if someone starts wobbling or something to make sure they let me know. One of the things in the, in the trachea is the mucus that's created, that is being created in these tubes and is drawn up into the back of the throat by the cilia in here. And one thing to do when students are passing around the, the trachea is to feel inside that it is slimy and slippery. So that's quite a nice thing to show. Once they've got their orientation, we can start looking at where does the trachea go? The trachea has a load of connective tissue around it. Interesting thing to bring up, connective tissue. We don't really talk about it very much in, in biology, but it's a fundamental part of keeping everything where it is in the body. Doesn't, so things don't rub against each other. Um, so we can pull it, pull it apart and see the tr that the trachea is being held, obviously not held in place because we've taken it out of the organism, 
but it would be held in place by this connective tissue. We can start seeing that the trachea is quite long and goes down in between the lungs, down to a, a point here where it's about to bifurcate. So I think we'll cut down the rings of cartilage and see what we can see inside the trachea. I like to use scissors as much as I can. I find it a nice simple safety precaution because with a scalpel you don't know what resistance you're going to receive when you're cutting and with scissors your fingers are automatically out of the way. So I'm going to cut down uh, between the C-shaped rings of cartilage where there's the gap in the C and we can start opening up the trachea, go all the way down and we can really see this ribbed rings of cartilage. They're not rings anymore because we're opening them out. But there they are, the cartilage pieces. There's one here that, that isn't just a ring. It's got two uh, bands to it. It's broken. Slight changes between each one, thicknesses. Sometimes that's not represented in diagrams. Real life is a bit messier than, than diagrams. But as we go further down, there's one thing in particular that I've never seen in a diagram. There. Part of the airway branches off before you get down to the bifurcating uh, trachea into two bronchi. Now, in diagrams and in animations, you always see, I've always seen, a, the trachea traveling down as a tube and then branching out into the two bronchi, which we can see down there. They ignore this little, this little tube here. For students learning biology, it doesn't really make much difference if they're never aware of that, that tube, but I like the idea that actually seeing real things shows students that it's not just as simple as what they see in, in in school, in the textbooks of, of school. Um, they have to be simplifications. So the lungs are split into lobes and one lung has two lobes and the other lung has three lobes. And this tube here supplies a part of this lung. By doing a small bit of inflation we can actually see which bit that tube supplies. So I think we'll give that a go. This is a standard foot pump that is used to inflate airbeds. We've attached a plastic tube to it that's an appropriate size. I prefer to use a, a pump rather than blowing into it because you don't know what kind of matter you're going to uh, eject as the air comes back at you. The, the lungs have an elastic recoil which is how which is actually how we breathe out. Um, and I don't want them elastically recoiling and pushing blood or whatever mucus back into in my direction. It can be a good idea to do the inflation in a plastic bag. Uh, you want the students to be able to see what's going on, but you don't want aerosols uh, traveling traveling to the students. The lungs that, that you will get will have slashes on them and so the slashed bits are the particular places where you might get aerosol release. So let's have a go at inflating this area. I'm going to take the tube, push it down until I get a good seal in that tube hold that seal and I would probably get a student to have a go at pumping this but I will push down here and there we're getting inflation inflation only down to this bit so this this part of the lung is not supplied by this tube but the upper upper lobe is supplied by the tube and the elastic recoil the lung is deflating I need to push air in to inflate it and then releasing the pressure, the elastic recoil pushes the air from the lungs back out. And if I have a feel, I might get some students in to feel this, I can feel it crackling. 
the air is being pushed out and that air is in tiny, tiny alveoli. We're using this pluck to meet certain learning objectives that show how the structure of the lung and breathing system relates to their function. The C-shaped rings of cartilage holding the trachea open. We can see that again when we cut open a bit of the lung and see how it is a massive, massive surface area. I'm going to cut through one bit that I inflated earlier and see if there's any colour differences. There we go. As we cut through, we can see it is still, it's very spongy. And there are loads of tubes. And we can see the spongy nature. It's actually easier for students to feel the spongy nature. They'd have to get very close up to see the spongy nature. It's very, very light. One of the things that I think is very valuable to do is just to cut off a section of the lung and cut off a bit of the, the heart that you've got and pass those round and students can weigh up the differences. And the lung tissue is really, really light. It's, it's mainly air, which is what its purpose is, to create a, a, a surface between the air and the blood for gas exchange. One of the other things to look at, again, that shows differences between the real thing and diagrams is to track these tubes down into the lungs. And as I track through one bronchus, it doesn't just, as in lots of diagrams, bifurcate into two and then bifurcate into two again and two again and two again. There is suddenly a mass of tubes coming off this bronchus immediately. And these will branch and branch into bronchioles, but they don't have a large tube turning into two smaller tubes and then those two smaller tubes turning into two small, slightly smaller tubes. Some small tubes come straight off from the big ones. So here we've got, here, still held open by rings of cartilage. We've got a small tube there, but larger tubes as well. It's not such a kind of organised system as, it, as you might be led to believe in the, in the diagrams or animations that you see. Another good thing about using the scissors is they're excellent for tracking tubes. Put one part of the scissors into the tube and cut and immediately you're opening this, the tube up. So I can just choose which tube I want to follow and see where it goes. And I like to ask students, which tube do you want to follow? Where should it go? How, which bit supplies the very tip of the lungs? And students can guess and we can track, what, track that down and you can see where you've been and just further down, open it up. And at some point, these rings of cartilage end and then you're into much smaller tubes, and these are exceptionally difficult to track. Um, but we can talk about how then that area is being supplied by this tube that we've, that we've tracked. I think it's really important to do practical dissections, get students to see the real life biology, is a great opportunity for the teacher and students to have a learning conversation. The students are constantly, in my experience, asking questions where does this go? What's this for? And the teacher may not know. The teacher is learning as well. The teacher isn't just the font of all knowledge. The students' questions are just as valid as the teacher's questions, and the teacher's lack of knowledge is just as valid as the student's lack of knowledge. They're exploratory learners uh, finding out new things together.